Welcome to Class Matters, the podcast where we ask the question, what would our country look like if it were governed by and for the working class? Class Matters is a project of the Debs Jones Douglas Institute. I'm Catherine Isaac, Executive Director. In this episode, we take a look at one of the recent Supreme Court rulings, West Virginia versus the Environmental Protection Agency, and find out why this case is about more than climate change and what that might mean for working people in the United States. We are joined today by Jenny Breen, Gordon Lafer, Adolf Reed Jr., and Samir Santi. Welcome to all of you. But before we get started, an announcement about episode seven of Class Matters. Adolf Reed Jr. and Toure Reed will discuss Adolf's new book, The South, Jim Crow and Its Afterlives. Then they'll tackle questions from our listeners. Head over to our website or Twitter to send us your questions. Let's start with introductions, and then we'll turn it over to Samir Santi to lead the discussion. Jenny Breen is Associate Professor of Law at the Syracuse University College of Law, where she teaches constitutional law, administrative law, and labor law. Her interdisciplinary research explores democratic politics in practice, including the politics of work and immigration. Gordon Lafer's union activism includes running a hotel workers campaign with local 142 of the International Longshore and Warehouse Union in Hawaii. He served as senior labor policy advisor for the US House of Representatives Committee on Education and Labor. He's written widely on labor and employment policy issues. And he is the author of The 1% Solution, How Corporations Are Remaking America One State at a Time. He is a professor at the University of Oregon and director of its Labor Education and Research Center. Adolph Reed Jr. has been involved in working class politics for more than half a century. He is Professor Emeritus of Political Science at the University of Pennsylvania. His research interests include American and Afro-American politics and political thought, urban politics, and American political development. He serves on the board of the Debs Jones Douglas Institute and is the author of several books, most recently, the South, Jim Crow, and its afterlives. Samir Santi has worked as a political organizer for the Pennsylvania Association of Staff, Nurses, and Allied Professionals, and as a researcher for Unite Here, which represents hospitality workers in the U.S. and Canada. He teaches at the City University of New York School of Labor and Urban Studies. Again, welcome to Class Matters. And Samir, I will now turn it over to you. Thanks, Catherine. It's very good to be here, and welcome to everyone who's listening. So as Catherine mentioned, today we're going to discuss the central question of this podcast, what the country would look like if it were governed by and for the working class as it pertains to the Supreme Court. If you aren't a lawyer, you probably don't spend much time thinking or talking about the court except when it issues an important decision. And as everyone knows, it just had a blockbuster session which concluded with some really important decisions, those bearing on abortion, gun rights, and the federal government's ability to address climate change. Of course, lots of airtime has been given to the Supreme Court in recent weeks, pundits talking about the significance of these decisions and what they suggest about what's to come from the judiciary. But one thing that's almost entirely missing from all this coverage is what these decisions and the direction the court is moving more generally mean for the working class. The fact is, as we'll talk about today, the decisions that the Supreme Court makes have enormous consequences for working people even if this significance is often concealed behind technical legal jargon. And this has always been the case. Until the New Deal, when we got the right to unionize, when we got Social Security, wage and hour laws, and more in the 1930s, the court was arguably the biggest obstacle standing in the way of policies favorable to working people. Time and again, the court struck down minimum wage laws, hour regulations, child labor restrictions, and other beneficial pro-worker reforms. It was only in the context of immense struggles waged by working people, together with the pressure placed by Franklin D. Roosevelt's administration, that they finally backed down and allowed the New Deal reforms to go through. And those reforms remain the principal social protections in this country. But as the labor movement's gotten weaker over the past few decades, the court has reverted to that older anti-worker posture. Sometimes it does so in obvious ways, like when it ruled in the Janus case that the entire public sector might be right to work. And other times, it does so in less obvious ways. Today, we're gonna talk about one of those less obvious decisions that's still very consequential for working people, the court's decision in West Virginia versus EPA, which has been the subject of some excellent articles by Professor Jenny Breen, who's with us today. So to start, I wanna start with Jenny because she's the authority on the legal questions and has written about this already. 
the court issued this West Virginia versus EPA decision on its last day of its session this year. And it basically concluded that the agency has no authority, that the EPA has no authority to regulate power plants to address climate change. It seems like a pretty specific decision, like focusing on the EPA and emissions from power plants. But you and others have argued that this isn't just about the EPA or climate change, but about the idea of government regulation more broadly. So could you start by walking us through the decision and why it's so significant? Yeah, I would be happy to. Thanks, Samir, and welcome to everyone joining us today. This decision, as Samir just said, is a lot bigger than just about one particular proposed regulation by the Obama administration in 2015 that never actually even went into effect. Instead, this decision really speaks to, as Samir pointed out, the ability of agencies to act in meaningful ways on their legislative mandates from Congress. So the way we get from kind of point A to point B and looking at this particular decision is thinking about how the court reached the conclusion that it did in this case. So the question for the court was whether EPA had the ability to regulate power plants under the Clean Air Act, which was an act passed by Congress in 1970 to really clean up the air in really pretty ambitious ways, right? And one of the things the Clean Air Act did was it required the EPA to regulate power plants for the pollutants that they were emitting. And what the Obama administration had proposed doing was this plan that they called the Clean Power Plan. So it never was actually implemented. Then the Trump administration rescinded it. The Biden administration says it's doing something else entirely. So it's not even really something that's possible to be implemented at this point, but the Supreme Court really wanted to weigh in on this plan, even though it wasn't happening in any way, shape, or form. So the question is why? And it's because it lets the Supreme Court get at this question of the authority of agencies to act. So the agency here was acting under the authority of the Clean Air Act, which directed the EPA to set a standard of performance for pollutants from power plants And what the EPA decided is that the best system was one that shifted to renewable energies. And what the court says here in this particular opinion, and again, this is why the opinion is so consequential, is that the agency had no power to make that determination, that the best system was one that shifted from renewable energies, because essentially it was a really important question. So because it's a really important issue, the agency can't act. And the way that the court describes this is it says that it's part of the major questions doctrine. But the bottom line here is that the agency is telling agencies that you're not going to be permitted to take action on things that really matter and are really important unless Congress specifically directed you to do the exact particular thing you're trying to do. So the impact is going to be really substantial on limiting how agencies can act in important matters. Thanks for that, Jenny. I just want to, I guess, underscore or make sure we're clear on the doctrinal point here, which is this major questions idea. It seems like there are a lot of different things that could be classified as a major question. And so, I mean, can you just elaborate a little bit more on what this is, what the history of this idea is, and imagine other ways in which it might be impactful? This particular interpretation of major questions might be impactful for workers. Yeah, I mean, there isn't much history to speak of because it's a new doctrine. This is the first time that the Supreme Court has ever used the words major question doctrine in a majority opinion. So it's popped up. Justice Gorsuch has been pushing it and concurring and dissenting opinions. It's it's popped up in other iterations, but this is the first time the court has fully embraced it, right? And when the court tries to cite precedent that it's relying on, it's only a handful of cases, right? Including two other cases from this term. So it's really a pretty new doctrine. But And when Smear, when you say, well, major questions is a pretty broad term, totally. And it's not clear how anyone is going to know when something is a major question. So the court says, in quote, extraordinary cases, the major questions doctrine will apply. Well, what does that mean? What's an extraordinary case? We don't have clear guidance from the court. What the court says is that if something is the subject of public debate, a lot of people are talking about it. Maybe that means it's a major question. If it's going to be really expensive, maybe that means it's a major question. They also suggest that when an agency is doing something new, when they're like taking a novel approach to an issue, 
maybe that raises a red flag for the court. Maybe that is a major question. So there's a lot of, I think a lot of people are concerned about the impact of major questions for precisely the reason you note that it's going to be really difficult to anticipate when the court is going to see a major question. And, you know, it has that kind of, you know, you know it when you see it feel, but what that really does is open up the court to just decide to take cases, to call cases major questions, and to block agencies, right, from acting. I say if you don't mind, man. Yeah, jump in. Well, also from the standpoint of somebody who's not in the game, as it were, it could seem like the contention that executive branch agencies should be limited in executing or in conducting what would seem to be legislative power that's been delegated to Congress would be a good thing. But clearly, well, so why is it not a good thing? So you're asking, why would it not wait? Can you say, rephrase it, Adolf? Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, well, so if I heard this in a barbershop, mm-hmm. right, like my first reaction might be, well, the executive branch agencies should be constrained by the intent of Congress. So what's the problem here? Okay, yeah, that's a great question. And they are constrained by the intent of Congress. So agencies are creatures of statute. They don't exist independently of Congress. So they only exist because Congress created the agency, tells them what to do. In this case, the EPA was trying to act under the Clean Air Act, right? That's what the agency is doing when it's writing rules. It's executing the law. But what non-delegation advocates would say is, well, they're writing law, right? That's enacting, that's using the legislative power. But if you think of the legislative power in that kind of broad a conception, that agencies are using the constitutional legislative power every time they enact a regulation, then I'm not sure what the vision is that the executive branch does. The executive branch can't do anything. It would have to only, it would say it's a vision of governance in which Congress spells out every little detail of what an agency does and dots the I's and crosses the T's. And we know that in reality, what that would mean is that agencies don't do anything, right? Because Congress is just not capable of crafting legislation at that level of detail. So you're right. The non-delegation doctrine exists for a reason, but the way that people interpret it is this very, or that way that activists want to interpret it is this very kind of broad conception, which would just prevent agencies from acting at all. Thanks. Thanks. Jenny and Ada. You know, one other point, not to belabor this sort of civics lesson and, you know, the three branches of government too much, but I think an interesting point you make in the piece is about the argument that Justice Neil Gorsuch makes about the separation of powers and the power of what he calls unelected bureaucrats as Mm -hmm. sort of this ruling class, as he calls it. And can you just comment maybe on the irony of a comment like that coming from a lifelong appointed Supreme Court justice and the extent to which there is democratic participation in what we call the administrative state? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that I think is most kind of absurd about the application of the major questions doctrine is it seems to me that it's these cases that present what the court has newly calling major questions are cases in which judicial intervention is maybe least appropriate because in these cases, if it is a case where there's great national debate over something or it's a huge budget impact or millions of people or businesses or companies are going to have to pay lots of money, this will be an issue that people are already talking about and engaged with politically, right? So what the court says is in those instances, and we have those kinds of cases, we're going to assume that the agency should not act and we, the court, are going to stop the agency from acting, right? Well, to me, it would make much more sense to let the agency act on its congressional mandate, assuming, you know, applying all other review rules, right? So there's, you would apply standard, if it's unconstitutional, no, the agency cannot act. If it's outside of the statutory mandate, no, the agency cannot act. But assuming all of those conditions are met, then there's no reason to not just let the agency act. And then if the agency has overstepped and it is a major question that people are talking about, it's really expensive, whatever, people will get mad about it. And agencies are constrained by, they're part of the executive branch. They're part of, right, the president oversees them, an elected official, right? They're congressional representatives. Congress plays an oversight role with agencies, right? They can defund agencies. They can call people in for hearings. There's lots of small d democratic check 
on agencies stepping outside of their mandate to say nothing for the fact that before you even get to a rule, the rule that was proposed here, the clean power plan, goes through very extensive notice and comment rulemaking, right, where it's months of the agency puts out a proposed rule, people comment on it, there are hearings, there are discussion, there are revisions, the agency has to respond to comments. So there's a lot of small d democratic involvement in crafting these rules. And then again, in major questions cases, if the agency oversteps, you would expect there to be a lot of small d democratic revolt, right, if the agency oversteps. So what the court does here, though, is totally cut off that process and decide that it, a body of nine, totally unaccountable at all, unelected, lifetime appointed people who have, again, no accountability to anybody, that they're going to step in and stop it. And I think what this reveals is that the point of the major questions doctrine is not to make sure Congress retains power, which is what Gorsuch and others argue, but it's instead just to prevent the administrative state from acting because the default is no regulation. That's the default. The assumption is that there should be no regulation. So it always, or the court always steps in to deregulate. So rather than letting the agency regulate and then letting the political process step in, if there is an overstepping, the court's assumption is that regulation is a problem. And then you have to kind of, an, you know, justify your existence for any regulation rather than letting the democratic process work itself out. Thanks. That's an extremely clear explanation. I want to maybe pivot slightly, but actually stick with our friend Justice Neil Gorsuch, as he's, you know, one of the chief architects of this agenda. You pointed out, Jenny, in, in one of your pieces, and, and, and this question, I think we should broaden out and Gordon and Adolf should weigh in as well. You've pointed out that there's another tactic going on in his concurring opinion. So this is not everyone signed on to this, but Justice Gorsuch wrote an opinion that was supporting the majority decision. Can you talk about that? Like, has it really been commented on a lot and may have been missed if you didn't read, you know, the footnotes and everything, which you have to do if you're going to get all the texture of these decisions. But thankfully, we have a legal scholar here who does that for a living. So, Jenny. In Justice Gorsuch's concurrence, which was signed on to only by Justice Alito, so it was just Gorsuch and Alito joining this concurring opinion, Gorsuch kind of spells out, because they, the majority opinion is written by Justice Roberts, and it's a lot of kind of trying to soft pedal what is a pretty radical decision in this case, right? So Gorsuch, thankfully, has no concerns about soft pedaling anything, and just in the concurrence lays out what's going on with the major questions doctrine and says, well, this is what we're doing here with the major questions doctrine. And in the process of making the argument about the importance of the major questions doctrine, he drops a footnote in which he says that He's citing here President Woodrow Wilson, who's one of our most notoriously racist presidents, which is saying something. I mean, that's a pretty high bar to be up there in the top. But there he is up on the top, and he's citing President Wilson, who is complaining that popular sovereignty makes it harder to run the nation. So the vote is a hindrance. It's so annoying that people have to vote. And then he quotes Wilson talking about people, European immigrants being backwards and ignorant, African-Americans being also backwards and ignorant, and poor white men of the South. And he does that, as I say, not, I think, to teach us a history lesson, right, but to make the argument that people who want an efficient government, who want government to actually be able to do things for people, are anti-democratic and don't want the people to run things. This want a government run by elites, right? That they're racist and elitist and nativist. And later in his concurrence, he actually describes the dissenters as echoing Wilson, which is really, I think, a striking move there to call his fellow justices racist and nativist and elitist, which is what he's doing there. But the core argument is that if you want a functioning government that can actually do things for people, that you are anti-democratic and elitist and apparently racist too, right? So it's a really strong rhetorical move to try and discredit support for a functioning administrative state. Gordon, Adolf, you want to weigh in on the significance of this or why you think Gorsuch would tuck something like that in a footnote the way that he did? I have a couple of thoughts. I mean, one is I think the argument of saying 
these decisions should be made by Congress instead of agencies is disingenuous because it's impossible for Congress to make decisions at this level of specificity. I can tell you like when I worked in the House of Representatives for two years and among other things, we, there was a coal mining disaster where 29 people lost their lives and we wanted to regulate, create whistleblower rights for underground coal miners. And the industry comes in with a bunch of studies and says, well, something like, you know, that shouldn't apply to situations where there's less than two parts of methane per 100 billion at something less than 600 feet below the surface. And somebody else comes in and says, well, actually the machinery, the way you measure parts of methane per billion is not accurate beyond more than 90%. And you're like, how the hell do I know what this is, right? And that's what the members of Congress do for an hour and a half. And then they go to something about, you know, regulating the shrimp boat industry in the Gulf of Mexico. And then they go to something completely different, which is equally complex. Like any one of these, you have to get very deep down to make law at the level that it would be concretely useful. So I think when they say, oh, this should really be done by Congress instead of by the agencies, what they're really saying is this should not be done at all because it's not possible for Congress to do it. And, you know, just to name, you know, there's a lot of things that this would regulate, but, you know, one of the things I was thinking of is, is OSHA, occupational safety regulations. So, and kind of similarly to environmental regulations, it's something that has gone in different directions depending on which administration is in office. And that's particularly true of ergonomic regulations. So OSHA was passed in 1970. People didn't know about ergonomic regulations. It's a huge issue for safety of construction workers, warehouse workers, office workers. And it's been going back and forth about can OSHA you know, have ergonomic safety regulations. So by this doctrine, I can imagine that if that gets to the Supreme Court, they could say, no, they didn't say that in 1970, so you can't do it, right? So essentially, we're saying we're going to protect workers at the level of medical knowledge that existed in 1970, and beyond that, you can't do. One other thing I would raise, and then I'll shut up because I'm sure other people have other examples, is laws around prevailing wage in the construction industry, which essentially says that publicly funded construction can't pay wages less than whatever is the average in the surrounding area because we don't want the government to play the role of undermining wage standards in the construction industry. The whole idea of prevailing wage laws has been attacked by part of the construction industry in ways like this thing about Woodrow Wilson. They say, oh, you need to know where prevailing wage really started was white workers in New York wanting to keep black people out of the construction industry, which I don't know the history, maybe that's true. But even if it's true, it's irrelevant, right? And the people who are opposed to prevailing wage are also lobbying against equal employment opportunity, against the right to sue for race discrimination on the job, right? This is not coming from racial justice warriors. Now, the way prevailing wage gets calculated is very complicated. You know, as soon as you start thinking, oh, how do we define what's the prevailing wage? Well, this is very contested. Do you measure the average? Do you measure it in a city? Do you measure it in a county? And so... All of those things have to be determined by an agency. And because, you know, as Jenny said, the logic of this decision is that we need to promote liberty and liberty always means less regulation. It's not hard to imagine somebody coming in with an argument, including the, the racism argument that says, therefore you have to have like the most minimally invasive form of prevailing wage, which will end up dramatically lowering wage standards in the construction industry. So there's a, I can think of a lot of dangerous places this could go. Well, let me just add on that. It's just worth noting that OSHA, the EPA, and Davis-Bacon, which established prevailing wage, were all passed under Republican presidential administrations, just for the record. Adolf, you want to jump in? Well, there's not a lot to add, really, except, I mean, I would just note that, as Gordon said, and, and uh, Jenny at least implied, the opportunism with which Gorsuch denounces the racist Woodrow Wilson is like an interesting commentary on where we are in American politics at this point. Because when you think about it, how was Bernie Sanders vilified by the Clintonites in both 2016 and 2020? It was the same kind of argument. He's not racially sensitive enough that being concerned with problems that affect working people detracts from the civil rights effort or from the racial justice effort. And I think there's a caveat there, like for all of us. Yeah, no, that's an important point. I think to maybe tie this all together a little bit, it would be worth considering the question of 
you know, we've discussed all these ways in which the Supreme Court is currently undermining the interests of working people. Is there a way in which we could imagine the court operating in the interests of working people? Is that possible? We've got courts. The courts aren't going anywhere. So what could a pro-worker judiciary look like? Have we ever had one before? If we have, what's it done? And either way, what might it look like in the 21st century? Well, I'll say like most of the political scientists, I do much better at predicting what's already happened than I do <laughs> predicting what's going to happen. So I can take a stab at that one. Yeah, like for some moments, we have had a federal judiciary all the way up to the Supreme Court that's been more or less, mas o menos, has acted in the interest of working people, right? You go back to the 1937 case that upheld the constitutionality of the National Labor Relations Act, right? I think it was NLRB B. Jones and Lachlan Steele. Smith versus Allwright, that in 1944, the Supreme Court case that threw out the white primary and exponentially increased voting in the urban South with some, some of the most dramatic increases in places like Jacksonville, Atlanta, New Orleans, Durham, Brown, Robert well, the Brown decision in 1954, but that finally put an end to the separate but equal doctrine, but also labor cases, three of them in 1944 that were on one level civil rights cases, but they were also cases that strengthened the trade union movement, two railroad and one boilermaker case in that year, which actually established the duty of fair representation as part of the trade union movement. And then finally, like one that people don't think about often, but Harper versus the Virginia State Board of Elections that eliminated the poll tax. And then, of course, the following year, like the Loving case that threw out the last vestiges of anti-miscegenation laws. And all those restrictions that had been imposed on people fell disproportionately on, guess what? People who work for a living. And from that perspective, I think it's kind of helpful for us to think more expansively about what working class court decisions, what it would look like, right? In the same way that it makes sense, I think of creation of the EPA and of OSHA clearly as pro-worker interventions. But at this point now, like we're at the present and like looking forward, so I'm out of my depth. <laughs> Anyone want to look forward or backwards? I'll look forward. I'm not making any predictions either, but you know, the kind of things that could be done, you know, Samir, you've often pointed out that one of the best things the Biden administration has done is the NLRB's, the National Labor Relations Board's rulings on the union election procedure. And at some point, either that's going to be challenged by a future administration or it's going to come to the Supreme Court and they're going to have to decide one way or the other. And this also is an issue of historical interpretation, right? So the law is written in 1935, and it says, for instance, you can't threaten workers against forming a union. So right now that's interpreted in the most narrowly, you know, kind of ridiculously narrow way, which is if your supervisor says like, oh, I don't know what these union people are thinking. They're obviously not thinking about their family's livelihood because a lot of people here are gonna lose their jobs. That's not considered a threat unless they say, Samir, if I see you wearing a union button, you're never going to get a promotion. Like unless it's an explicit quid pro quo, it's considered to not be coercive language, which is different from almost every other area of law. Like, you know, managers are not allowed to solicit employees for donations to a corporate PAC. It doesn't require a quid pro quo. They just say, well, there's an implicit power imbalance in this relationship. But the labor board doesn't do that. And I think some of what Jennifer Abruzzo, the NLRB general counsel right now, is doing is saying, no, let's take a common sense understanding of what it means to be coerced and to be threatened. And how does intimidation really work? And it may be that in 1935 or 1940, the labor movement was strong enough that the people who wrote the law said threat and they thought everybody knew what threat means. So now if the court upholds the current interpretation of the current NLRB, that could make a really big difference in people's ability to organize. And if it overturns it, then you know it'll go in just the opposite direction. And I think there's, you know, if we think of what are good decisions that they could make, you know, if they could make decisions like that, they could give workers more power over what happens to investments of pension funds and saying, well, we don't want that to go to sleazy companies who are anti-workers. That's also a question. Well, how do you balance that versus the fiduciary responsibility to make the highest return on your pension funds? So that's something that they could interpret. And, you know, when I think about particularly about workplace elections, you know, by polling, there's almost 60 million non-union workers who say they wish they had a union in their workplace. And there's less than 50,000 a year who actually get it. And that gap, which is, I think, 
is overwhelmingly because of fear. And so this comes, I think, directly to the question of, of what Jenny was talking about, which is how do you define liberty, right? Because you could define liberty as saying, oh, liberty is the ability that when a bunch of people want a union in the workplace, they get it, right? They have the freedom to, to self-organize. But my guess is that Gorsuch and Alito are gonna say, no, liberty is not constraining the free speech ability of employers to say whatever they want to people who they have power over. So I'm not predicting what's gonna happen, but this is a big thing that is coming up that could be affected by this decision. Mm -hmm. Jenny. I also will take the tack of maybe not predicting, but maybe more being descriptive of the current moment where I think the court is so, unfettered and it's it's really been a striking supreme court term even just some of the rhetoric not just what we saw from gorsuch in that footnote but like the alito majority opinion and the dobbs case is just using language to describe abortion and to describe pro-choice support in ways that i i wouldn't have expected to have seen in a supreme court opinion and, and really just taking in many you know case after case just really taking you know, bat and swing in for the fences, right? I mean, there's no restriction, no self-imposed restrictions by the court at all. And I think that certainly reflects to some extent just the fact that we have a 6-3 conservative majority on the court. But I also think it reflects the fact that Congress is broken and is not able to step in and like provide a counterpoint to the court in the way that it should be able to. I mean, like this EPA decision, for example, if we had a functioning Congress, Congress could just revise the statute and say they shouldn't have to, to be clear. I think that this is a ridiculous doctrine, but the Congress could step in and say, no, when we say best system of emission reduction, we mean let the EPA pick the best system of emission reduction, right? I mean, so there are different ways in which if we had a more functioning Congress, a more functioning electoral system, I think the Supreme Court would, I, I feel like would be more constrained in the kinds of decisions that they're making. And because I guess in, in my view, the court should be, as Justice Kagan says in the dissent in the EPA case, modest, right? The court should be there to check kind of as a backstop, right? In the cases that Adolf was talking about, right? Ensuring that people can participate in the political process, right? Ending white primaries, ending segregation, right? Things like that, requiring the duty of fair representation in unions, that backstop for people is what we want of courts. We don't want to be in a position where we're relying on courts to save us. I mean, that's, that's a bad position to be in. And right now it, it kind of feels like because we're looking in all these different directions and we don't we don't see other opportunities, I think sometimes it can feel extra despairing that the Supreme Court is so hard line right now. But I, I guess I would say that I, I think part of what we're seeing is a reflection of breakdowns in other parts of the political system that reflect and that are exacerbated by the court, right? Court, some of the court's decisions on election law and gerrymandering and things like that have exacerbated those problems, certainly. Well, I was just thinking about where we are at this moment. I mean, if the court has become the point of the lance of like constitutional coup, basically, right? And I mean, especially if we look forward to the next session, and maybe Jenny, you can say something about this case too, Mooney, the one that could in principle authorize state legislatures or could relieve state legislatures of any commitment to follow the actual outcome of the vote of an election in a state when it comes to assigning electoral college votes, which could basically render voting useless or beside the point. But I guess one question is, and this does call for looking toward the future a little bit, is how likely you think it is that the majority will feel so emboldened that they'll uphold the extreme version of that interpretation and what that means for us and then what the options for us would be if they do. Yeah, the case is Moore v. Harper, and it's it's a case right. out of North Carolina, which has been kind of one of many ground zeros for partisan gerrymandering, you know, where the, the congressional delegation doesn't look like the state, right, in terms of an overwhelming Republican congressional delegation and a much more kind of, you know, what we would call purple a kind of state population. And the theory put forward in the case, and I think people are alarmed because this, it has been put forward before, but the Supreme Court accepted the cert petition, meaning it's going to hear the case. And this is, side note, I mean, this is one of the things that's really is testament to how 
activists this court is that they keep taking these cases that, as Kagan pointed out in the EPA dissent, the Supreme Court has a discretionary docket, largely discretionary. They don't have to hear most of these cases. So they reach out to take these cases because they want to be amending the Constitution and shifting the way that we live and the way that our political system functions in the United States. And I think that's the most unsettling aspect of all of this. Is there really active effort to reach out and proactively take that judicial power that they have and really strengthen it? So in the Moore v. Harper case out of North Carolina, the petitioners are putting forward this claim that when it comes to setting rules for elections, that only the state legislature has the ability to determine what the rules are. And that could apply also, as Adolf pointed out, the way that votes are counted, the electoral college, it's a different portion of the constitution, but it's the same rationale. So if you win on this, you would apply it to that universe too. And that is not how it has typically been interpreted, right? Typically, we understand the Constitution's language regarding the state legislature has the ability to set the date, time, place, and manner of elections to mean the state, right? The state government. So if the state constitution says no partisan gerrymandering or elections must be free and fair, that that the state legislature plan is subject to review by the state Supreme Court. There are other actors, right, that can intervene just like it would for any other law, right? So state legislature just means state law, right? The kind of state lawmaking process. But these petitioners in the North Carolina case want it to be only the state legislature because the North Carolina Supreme Court struck down the Republican General Assembly's partisan gerrymandered map and put in place a redistricting map created by three special masters quote unquote. So people who were outside experts who put into place a kind of neutral, looking at lots of data, sciencey kind of map, right, for redistricting. And these people are arguing that that is unconstitutional because the Constitution says state legislature. So it means that the Republican controlled General Assembly gets to decide what the maps look like. And that's really troubling for the reasons that Adolf said about the electoral count, just the control of federal elections, right? It's a really substantial power to give to state legislatures without any sort of check. Now, having said that, I feel like we are returning to the point about the importance of Congress because Congress can always step in and write rules to control federal elections. So if we had a more highly functioning Congress, Congress could write a rule that said, Maps can't be gerrymandered, right? They could say things like that, but they don't. So then we're left to individual states, but the backstop is the state's own courts and state constitutions, which often require more of states than the federal constitution does. So again, North Carolina and some other states have rules against gerrymandering, requiring free and fair elections, things like that. And that's what this litigation wants to make impermissible. Can I also try to tie this into a bigger picture, which may be too big? You know, when we say, like, are certain countries democratic? Are they democracies or not? The measure of that is not just is the election system free or fair, but also how much of society is subject to democratic control. So if you have like a perfectly free and fair democratic system, but all you're allowed to decide is the colors of the flag and name the national holidays, you don't have a democracy. And the point in history that we're in, obviously, is that the big business interests, which I would say are ultimately, ultimately the forces behind, the most powerful forces behind who's in the Congress and why we have the Supreme Court we want, have an agenda that is bipartisanly unpopular. They may get people to vote for their politicians based on culture wars and other things, but like, for instance, a majority of the country supports limits on executive salaries. A majority of the country supports a federal right to paid sick leave. A majority of the country thinks that when drugs are created with federal funding, like the COVID vaccines, that they should be owned by the public and instead of drug companies making a bundle off of that money should come back to the people. A majority of both parties think the minimum wage should be much higher. So from their point of view, 
how you deal with that partly is by all the voter suppression and gerrymandering stuff we've seen. And part of it is by taking a bunch of issues and putting them off the table and saying, you, these things you're not gonna be able to decide on. You can decide on this other stuff over here. And I think that's part of the goal of this decision is take a big bunch of things and say, well, you can think what you want, but this isn't really in the realm of democratic decision-making. And in that way, it's another step to really shrinking the size of our democracy. And that, in a nutshell, is why the working class should care about the Supreme Court. Well said, all of you. Thank you so much for this really excellent discussion. And thanks to our listeners. You have been listening to the Class Matters podcast. We were joined today by Jenny Breen, Gordon Lafer, Adolph Reed Jr., and Samir Santi. If you'd like to learn more about the major questions doctrine and why the Supreme Court is so important to the working class, please visit our website at classmatterspodcast.org. On our next episode of Class Matters, episode seven, Adolf Reed Jr. and Toure Reed will discuss Adolf's new book, The South, Jim Crow and Its Afterlives. Then they'll tackle questions from our listeners. So be sure to head over to our website or Twitter to send us your questions. Our editor is Jimmy Wirt. You've been listening to the Class Matters podcast. Subscribe to Class Matters wherever you listen to podcasts and support us on Patreon. Thank you for listening to Class Matters. 